Hello, I'm Mark Dunn, the editor of Investment Magazine Portfolio Institutional, and welcome to the third and final interview in our series of discussions with NN Investment Partners on what is the quite important topic of engagement. Now, this particular interview looks at engagement in practice. And joining me to discuss this is Isabel Edwards, who is a Green Bond Analyst. Welcome, Isabel. Hi, thanks for having me. No, no, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining me. Um, if we could start at the top here. Um, now, you work for a Green Bond Fund at NN Investment Partners, of course. There are many different definitions of what engagement is, but what does it mean to you and your colleagues on the team? Yeah, I mean, for us, it's a bit different. We're a green bond fund uh, only. And so we manage a fund made up of only labelled bonds, uh, meaning our engagement is slightly different uh, in that most of our conversations on a day to day basis revolve around the projects in green bond frameworks uh, of the issuers bonds that we hold. Um, however, when an ESG issue comes to our attention at the general company level of an issuer uh, mm -hmm. and we hold their bond, we will also engage uh, since our green bond assessment methodology doesn't just assess the bond, but also the issuer's sustainable actions um, at a company level. Uh, it's a large part of what we spend our time on, actually. Um, mm -hmm. We engage pre-issuance when a new green bond is coming to the market to see if the bond and the issuer meets our criteria. We also engage for extra information on an ad hoc basis or for ESG updates. And we can also engage when we receive the allocation and impact reports um, a year after the mm -hmm. bond issuance. Um, so we can meet multiple issuers a week throughout the year. It's a key part of what we do. OK, that's quite, that's quite interesting. Could you actually put that in a bit of context for us here? I mean. Um, how many engagements do you work on average throughout the year? And, you know, what's the sort of focus of these discussions? Yeah, well, in 2021, uh, we had about uh, 87 uh, engagements with issuers uh, in about 10 different sectors across the world. Uh, mm -hmm. This is slightly less than usual, though. Um, normally, it's around 100 issuers. Um, and the reason for less engagement uh, in 2021 was because uh, green bond issuers are, in fact, uh, getting better. They are providing more information up front in their uh, green bond frameworks and their investor presentations, allocation and impact reports. Um, so it means that we have the information quicker and we need fewer calls to try and dig for that information. Um, so in general, we engage most often uh, with the financial sector issuers, uh, since there are generally more questions to ask. Uh, they have more controversies um, on average uh, related with them. So it's good to make sure that we have all of that information up front. Um, then governments, utilities and technologies and materials make up the rest of our engagements. Um, our um, rejection rate is around 29% um, in our green bond database based off of our relevant universe. And this rejection rate uh, <laughs> tends to increase year on year as more issuers come to market, uh, we do tend to uh, have a higher rejection rate. So our positive impression went down a little bit uh, in 2021 with about 55% uh, of meetings being positive and 28% uh, having a neutral impression. But this is kind of in keeping with how things go and our rejection rate. Um, we have a mostly European focused uh, portfolio. So that was where most of the engagements were. Uh, but then we also have some uh, Asia and North America focus as well. Okay. And is what you actually discuss with issuers, does that vary depending on the type of issue, the type of industry? Yeah, I mean, there isn't a set script for what we will talk about. It really depends on the issue that we're calling to address. So pre-issuance, uh, we will engage, we'll ask about the Green Bomb framework, what are the projects, what information can they tell us about them, and what they're promising in terms of their yearly reporting. Um, we also use this moment to address any ESG issues that are flagged next to, next to the issuer's name in uh, you know, ESG data providing um, databases. Uh, and then in the yearly impact report calls, uh, we will mostly check the credentials and source of the data that is provided in those reports, the baselines, the assumptions behind the methodology. Um, and then for the ad hoc calls throughout the year, uh, this could really be anything that's come up. Uh, it will focus on ESG issues that have arisen in the news and the media around that company and we'll ask about that issue, what action has been taken to resolve it, and the timeline for resolution that we could expect. Could you give me an example of where you and your team were through engagements and improved uh, an issuer's uh, ESG credentials? 
Yeah, a good in, a positive example that we have um, is uh, Iberdrola. Uh, we started to engage with them um, in around um, 2017. And Iberdrola is quite a good example of a company that has taken their transition plan um, quite seriously. And uh, they aimed to uh, completely phase out coal fire power plants in 2020. And the company has achieved this in their 2020 annual report. Uh, the offshore wind uh, component is the most profitable uh, renewable energy source for Iberdrola and has also become uh, one of its important transition tools in its plan. Um, and Iberdrola then set a target as a result of that of having between 12 and 18 gigawatts of operating capacity installed by 2030. Um, so we very much appreciate what this company has done over the past few years since we've been engaging um, in the field of their uh, energy transition. Um, and their eligible green assets are included in uh, their green bonds, uh, including hydropower. And during our first engagement meeting in 2017, we advised them to seek additional verification to ensure both uh, social and environmental issues were assessed. And uh, following the release of the draft EU taxonomy, uh, Iberdrola also added power density criteria for its eligible hydropower assets which is uh, one of the criteria uh, for hydropower included in the EU taxonomy, uh, demonstrating its efforts to try and align with uh, the latest best practice. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Now, because you mentioned there the 29% in your opening comments there, and then, because not every engagement you have will be successful. So what happens when there's a negative outcome from an engagement? Yeah, we, we had a name in our portfolio that was considering a loan to the Carmichael Open Pit Coal Mine in Australia, mm -hmm. which was not in line with the lending policies uh, discussed during the pre-issuance information and meeting. Um, when we heard the news that the loan was being considered, we tried to engage multiple times in meetings about the loan and to assess whether it was likely that the loan would actually happen and to receive more information. And then after multiple attempts, uh, to gain a meeting and multiple weeks went by, we were not able to uh, get this meeting and it seemed um, like we weren't going to in the future either. Gotcha, gotcha. Now it's not just companies and banks that are, are issuing green bonds at the moment, governments have also come into the market, which is quite welcome, but uh, is it very different uh, engaging between a corporate and a sovereign? Well, with corporate green bond issuers, there are controversy reports and scores from ESG data providers, uh, which we can use to see the different ESG issues that arise for, for those issuers. Um, however, when you look at sovereigns, there isn't as easy a way um, to track the controversies as for corporates. So we use an ESG score with a carbon intensity score to exclude some countries. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to regular updates on ESG controversies in the country, we have to be a bit more creative and use various different tools to get a clear picture about the situation in the country. Um, however, sovereign green bond issuers have been very open to engagement and will often directly contact us um, to get feedback on their green bond frameworks or impact reports. So we see sovereign green bond issuers as a positive contribution to the green bond space, even if um, you know, the ESG data pro um, provision isn't as um, uh, robust as for corporates. Gotcha, gotcha. And could you tell us which sovereigns you're currently engaging with? Well, it varies throughout the year, um, but sovereign engagement is something NNIP adopts widely um, in relation to a number of our strategies. So not just us on the Green Bond team, but uh, for us, um, we've engaged with Germany, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, Turkey, UK, and, uh, and others in the past year. Um, we have a sovereign Green Bond fund, so we are always interested to see more sovereign Green Bond issuers come to the market for the first time or as part of an ongoing Green Bond program. Um, at the beginning of 2019, we met the Dutch State Treasury uh, for a pre-issuance engagement prior to the launch of their inaugural Green Bond. Uh, and we focused on the issuance plan and the use of proceeds. And we shared our views on the eligibility of the Green Bond criteria uh, that they were going to put forward. Um, while the issue details were being finalized, a second discussion took place on the detailed proceeds allocation and the impact reporting methodology. And uh, based on the credible green bond framework, we deemed this issue to be green and eligible for our green bond portfolios. But we didn't leave it there. We want to keep regular engagement going. Um, so one year after issuance, they published their allocation and impact report. And we had a third meeting with them in September 2020 to discuss this. So um, as I was mentioning, first of all, there are various different points that we engage. It's not just that we engage once and then leave them to it. We like to keep uh, regularly updated with the issuers in our portfolio. Um, and in that third meeting, we talked about uh, certain information that we thought could be better incorporated for subsidy-based impact reporting. Um, sovereign issuers 
usually include subsidies, for example, for the renewable energy industry as part of their green expenditures, uh, including both the value of the subsidy and the overall value of the underlying project enables investors to estimate what proportion of the impact can be attributed to the individual subsidies. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. So when you invest in a green bond and you've been speaking to the issue and you're quite happy with the way things are going, what happens then? Do you just leave them to it or you check in? What, what, what happens then? Yeah, we prefer any time there is a change in the green bond framework or a new report mm -hmm. or any time there is new issuance that differs slightly from the last, um, any time there's an ESG issue in the media. Uh, it's not one size fits all. We just keep our finger on the pulse and keep regularly checking the issuers in our portfolio to make sure we have a steady dialogue set up and uh, are aware of any new activities. And if we see that we haven't engaged in a while, we just arrange a, a catch up call. OK, OK. Uh, now, COP26 happened in November 2021, and people's experiences and views of what happened there differ. Uh, but have there been any changes to how, you know, to what you're engaging with and sure issuers about since? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was actually at the uh, the COP26. I was lucky enough to, to be there in person. Um, for, for us, the biggest uh, COP26 takeaways, um, as our perspective on the Green Bond Fund, uh, is that we're going to start considering deforestation lending from financial sector issuers in the same way that we consider fossil fuel lending. So at the moment, fossil fuel lending gets the vast majority of the focus um, in terms of you know, exclusions and thresholds, but we're going to try and uh, bring in some um, harder thresholds in that. And uh, we're also going to encourage certain sectors to start reporting methane metrics in their impact reporting, not just the CO2 metrics. There's a lot of focus on methane for the first time in this latest COP, so we're happy to see that. And uh, we were already excluding financial sector bond issuers who had too high a percentage of their lending to fossil fuels. But we hope other investors start engaging with the companies in their portfolios and excluding as well. Gotcha. And of course, the EU taxonomy is now with us. I mean, how's that changed things? Yeah, the EU taxonomy showed that a lot of investors do not have a lot of information about the companies in their portfolios yeah. at the moment. This could change uh, in a couple of years, but um, in the advent of the EU taxonomy, that was the initial reaction. Um, aside from the specific reporting that was required in the EU taxonomy, this helps investors to know a lot more about the names in their portfolios. And when those uh, issuers provide that information that is required for the EU taxonomy, that's a lot more information that investors are going to have their hands on um, related mm -hmm. to those company names. Um, for us, we do our EU taxonomy assessments in-house. Uh, we've been engaging with all of the issuers in our portfolio about any missing components that we see in their EU taxonomy assessment uh, for each bond that we hold in our portfolio. And all of the issuers have been so compliant and helpful with this information. Um, we felt that this has so far been very collaborative, and we think that um, in the next couple of years, it's uh, going to be a lot more information on the market, a lot more transparent. Okay. Thank you very much, Isabel. And finally, where can people see the engagement figures and stats of, of the Green Bond team at NN Investment Partners? Yeah, if you want to see these, uh, we publish our engagement stats, um, mostly the numbers of engagements, the sectors most engaged with, the impressions, the geographical regions, et cetera, in our um, monthly strategy briefs that are available for download um, from the Green Bond Fund page at NNIP. And we also publish a more in-depth case study of our engagements, as well as the stats and figures in our yearly impact report, which is also available on our website if you'd like to read it. Thank you, Isabel. That was uh, quite comprehensive. And Thanks that, a lot. And that concludes our series of interviews on engagements with NN Investment Partners, all of which are available on portfolio-institutional.co.uk. I would like to thank all of our interviewees for sharing their thoughts on engagement with us. Thank you.